Good evening, Bula Yokwe. I hope I said that right, Minister Kabua. Welcome to the first gender dialogue hosted by UN Women's Fiji Multi Country Office and the Caribbean Multi Country Office. It's a pleasure to have you all with us today. I'm going to first hand over to my colleague, the representative of the Fiji Multi Country Office, Ms. Sandra Bernplau. Bula Vanaka, everyone, and warm Pacific greetings from Suva, Fiji. I'm Sandra, the UN Women Representative for the Pacific, and I'm so pleased to be joining together with our sister UN Women Agency in the Caribbean and my colleague, Tony Brugver, who is the representative there um, in welcoming all of you to the very first Small Island Developing State Feminist Dialogue. In this one, we're bringing together women leaders from the Pacific and the Caribbean, and we're honored to have our own Dame Meg Taylor, who is the Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, the Honorable Kitlan Kambua, who is the Minister for Education, Sports and Training, and we have a parliamentarian from the Caribbean region, Dame Billy Miller. So a big Pacific welcome and a vanakavakalevu or thank you to our sister UN Women Agency in the Caribbean. We hope to do more of these dialogues moving forward bringing together the shared experience of women across small island developing states between the Pacific and the Caribbean. So welcome to our very first one. I'll hand over to you, Tony. Thank you so much, Sandra. My name is Tony Broadber. I am the representative for the UN Women Multi-Country Office in the Caribbean. The Fiji Multi-Country Office and the Caribbean Multi-Country Office had a thought that we felt it was important to highlight and create a platform for the Pacific and Caribbean SIDS in order to explore common priority areas grounded in a feminist analysis and anchored to the normative framework in order to learn from the better practices and lessons in different areas that are relevant to our sustainable development and resilience. We also are looking to build stronger networks across the two regions recognizing so many commonalities, but also building on the lessons that are shared. And we want to make sure that we provide a safe and inclusive and diverse space for dialogue, reflection, and analysis of the key issues. As many of you already know, at the current rate of progress, it will be 130 years to reach gender parity at heads of government level and in national legislative bodies it will not be reached until 2063. Men hold 75% of the seats in parliaments around the world today. On average, across 20 Caribbean countries, women make up 27.4 members in the lower house of parliament and in the upper houses, 26.1%. Women are historically underrepresented in politics in the Pacific Islands. And at the same time, the Pacific Islands also experience some of the highest levels of the most egregious form of gender inequality that we see manifested violence against women in the, Carib in the world. And this is something that in the Caribbean we also experience as well. This is the first of what we hope will be many dialogues, sharing experiences between Pacific and Caribbean cities. And we focus today on women's leadership because we recognize we need more of it. We'll have an opportunity to speak with two women who chose to serve their countries in parliament and made the decision to do so at very young ages. And that's something that we'll explore a little bit more when we speak to them as well. We also want to examine some of the persistent barriers and the opportunities with regards to women's full and effective participation and decision-making in public life in small island developing states. And most of all, we really want to understand and share why women's contribution is essential to working to address the greatest challenges in our regions and the world. We are honored to have opening remarks from Dame Meg Taylor. Dame Meg Taylor is a national of Papua New Guinea and was appointed by the Pacific Islands Forum leaders in August of 2014 as the Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum a political grouping of 18 independent and self-governing states and territories. She is the first woman to hold this post in the 50 year history of the forum. 
Dame Meg began her professional life as private secretary to Chief Minister Michael Somare during self-government of Papua New Guinea, and then during his tenure as prime minister at the independence of Papua New Guinea. She has served in previous public, private, and diplomatic positions, including as Papua New Guinea's ambassador to Washington, DC. She was appointed to the post of vice president and compliance advisor ombudsman of the World Bank Group in 1999, setting up that compliance advisor ombudsman position, a key part of the governance structure of the World Bank Group. She, held, she led that office for 15 years and established a rich body of work. De Meg is also the Pacific Ocean Commissioner and as such advocates for the secure future of Pacific people based on the sustainable development, management and conservation of the Pacific Ocean and its resources. She also serves on the boards of a number of companies and organizations. I wish sometimes that we were in person so that we could give the kind of applause that a biography like that deserves. Dame Meg, I would like to hand over to you now for your remarks. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Tony, I appreciate that. <clears throat> Let me acknowledge uh, the Honorable Kitlan Kabua, Minister for Education, Sports and Training from the Republic of Marshall Islands, and Dame Billy Miller from Barbados and the Caribbean. And of course, your excellencies and distinguished guests and my sisters and brothers um, who have uh, tuned in for our seminar today. And greetings from the Blue Pacific. And this is a wonderful opportunity for an inter-regional conversation on an issue that is so pertinent to us and indeed very close to my heart. And I thank you and women for the initiative to facilitate such a dialogue. The Pacific region, like the Caribbean, is diverse in culture, language, natural, environment, and history. We share similar challenges and vulnerabilities as small island developing states in all spectrums of society, environmentally, economically, and socially. This dialogue today presents a valuable opportunity to discuss the progress of women in our respective regions, and more so the key challenges that we face in progressing gender issues and how we have tackled these in our regions. I am a Pacific Islander, but I come from the highlands of Papua New Guinea. My country is vibrant with its cultures and languages and societies, and indeed our culture forms the very fabric of our society in Papua New Guinea, a principle that is common across the Pacific region, and I'm sure also in the Caribbean. Whilst our culture is the basis for our individual identities and a source of pride for us, I have found that it has become one of the key unspoken barriers to our progress as women in our societies. Across the Pacific region, my experience has been that generally ours is a patriarchal society that is underpinned by religious and cultural attitudes towards us as women and our place in community. Our few and very few matrilineal societies, societies whilst very important for lineage and inheritance of land remain patriarchal in decision-making and power. This, in my view, is the root impediment to our progress. And if we are to really address this issue in the Pacific, then we need to significantly change the mindset to push for a behavioral change in our societies. We can institute and legislate laws and programs, and many have done so in the Pacific region. But if we do not address the root causes, we will continue to face the same challenges in the advance of women and gender issues. Last week, I had the opportunity to meet 28 young ladies from 12 primary schools and secondary schools in Suva, Fiji, where the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat is, is located. These young women, who are part of the student body leadership in their school shared with me their leadership journey. I was encouraged by the show of leadership in each student, their confidence, candor, and ability to navigate through the daily challenges that fa they face as young female leaders, despite the great responsibilities bestowed on their young shoulders. It was for me a reminder that leadership is not only about making it to parliament or making it to the helm of an organization, Leadership 
begins at home, in the schools, place of work, and in our communities. It is about making impactful and meaningful change, challenging the status quo, listening, and being the voice for those whose voices are not so powerful or loud. It is strength and vision, not just for yourself, but for those that you serve. Our young people will grow to lead our people and countries in the future. These are the ones that we need to grow, nurture and empower to reverse the trend, to break the stereotypes, to have more Pacific and Caribbean women taking on leadership and decision-making roles at all levels. The onus is not only on our young women, it rests with all of us, in particular, our young men. In recent weeks, I've been giving a lot of thought to this issue. As we empower our young women, we must also educate our young men, and we are not doing that in the Pacific region. How we raise our sons is critical for the future of our region. How they treat our women, how they respect our women is vital. We must continue to seek transformational change by nurturing, building, and encouraging more young women to take on the mantle of leadership in whatever capacity and way possible. And, and in doing so, realize their own and the dreams of others. Only then can we tear down the barriers that impede our fight for a more equal blue Pacific continent and the global community. <clears throat> in today's context, we must remain mindful that we in island states continually, continually face three-pronged crisis. The crippling impact of COVID, the devastating effects of climate change and disasters, and the crippling impact of the pandemic on our economic well-being. These challenges have diminished progress that we have made on gender issues in the Pacific region and in positions of leadership and influence today must guard against wiping out decades of hard-won advances, both in, that, in our social and development agendas. We have the responsibility of leadership today, and leadership today must ensure that an equal representation of views and voices are heard as we navigate our current challenges and build back resiliently. It is our individual and collective responsibility to provide the enabling environment. And unfortunately in the Pacific, uh, right across the region, our voices are not heard. We live in a global environment that is constantly changing. It is critical that we do not lose sight of the compounding and intersecting barriers on women and girls, full, full and effective participation in leadership and, and decision-making to address issues that impact us all. Again, the responsibility is on each of us to continue to work collectively and ensure that in the remaining years to 2030, we actively, we act decisively to close the gap and realize gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. And in this journey, we are going to have to do a lot more work to bring our young sons and brothers and young men along with us so that we achieve the goals that we want to achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dame Meg, for those impactful remarks. And it mirrors something that on International Women's Day, the president of Trinidad and Tobago said about an incident where another young woman lost her life and persons were referring to the man who did it as a monster. And she reminded the community that monsters are not born. These are boys that we raise into men who do monstrous things. Um, and if we want to do the work to achieve gender equality, we need to make sure that we're educating our boys and working as closely with our boys as we are empowering our women. Thank you so much, Dame Meg. We're going to get into the conversation now, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dame Billy, Dame Billy Miller. Dame Billy Miller is a distinguished Barbadian lawyer, politician, and former deputy prime minister who has carved a truly extraordinary path for women in leadership in the Caribbean and in Barbados. Beginning her career as an attorney at law and barrister in 1969, she was the only woman practicing at the private bar. Entering politics in 1976, Dame Billy was re-elected seven times as the member of parliament for the city of Bridgetown, 
which for those of you who may not know, is the capital of Barbados. Among many firsts, she was the first woman to sit on the cabinet of Barbados. Over the years, her ministerial portfolios have included health and national insurance, education with the addition of culture. She has been the Senator and Leader of Opposition Business, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Deputy Prime Minister, and Minister of Foreign Affairs, Foreign Trade, and International Business with the responsibility of Leader of the House of Assembly, Foreign Affairs, Tourism, and International Transport, and Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade from 1999 to 2008. She was appointed Ambassador at Large and Plenipotentiary of Barbados in May 2018. Dame Billy has also maintained a prominent regional and international career in politics, business, and civil society. She served as coordinator of CARICOM, which is the Caribbean Community Ministerial Spokespersons with Responsibility for External Trade Negotiations in 2003. She was the president of the board of directors of the Inter-American Parliamentary Group on Population and Development for the Caribbean and Latin America from 1999 to 2006. She was the chairperson of the Association of Caribbean States Ministerial Council from 2000 to 2001, and the first chairwoman of the Executive Committee of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association from 1996 to 1999, as well as the first chairwoman of the Caribbean Tourism Organization from 1997 to 1998. Dame Billy is highly distinguished nationally and internationally and was selected as laureate for the, the United Nations Population Award in 2008. Dame Billy is a graduate of Queen's College in Barbados and the Council of Legal Education in England and is an honorary fellow of the Florida International University and holds an honorary degree of Doctor of Laws conferred by the Council and Senate of the University of the West Indies. I would also like to give a warm welcome to the Honorable Minister Kitlan Kabua, who is the Minister of Education, Sports and Training in the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Minister Kabua is also a woman of first. At 28, she was elected to the legislature of the Marshall Islands, the Nitijela, and you can please let me know, Honorable Minister, if I'm getting the pronunciations correct, for Kwa Jalin in the, in the 2019 Marshallese general election, making her the first woman from the Kwa Jalin Atoll and the youngest person ever to be elected to the Nitijela. Minister Kabua is also the present chairperson of the Micronesian Center for Sustainable Transport and the vice chair of the Land Registration Authority Board and a member of the Kwajalein Educators Association. It gives me great pleasure to welcome both of you today to this gender dialogue. The first question that I have for you both is what inspired you to lead? What qualities brought you to this place and what qualities do you think that you bring that were important to contribute to your country and region? And do you think that these qualities are any, in any way linked to the fact that you are a woman? I'd like to pose this question first to Dame Billy. It starts with my parents. My father was an engineer and a member of parliament. He represented his constituency for 18 unbroken years. And um, my parents did not discriminate between their boys and girls. I am the eldest of six, unhappily now reduced to four. And what was given to me was responsibility. We were all treated in the same way, but I was always reminded, you have to be teaching these younger children the best way that they must go in this life. And that is true even up until this moment. But what inspired me to lead had to do with what I saw in politics. My father used to take me everywhere with him. And I remember the 
the um, the earliest election that I can remember is 1952. I was born in 1944, which was the year in Barbados when women got to vote for the first time. But they had to have money or property of a certain value before that could happen. Then in 1952, we got self-government and all you had to do to be able to vote was to be 21 years old, which later on became 18. And I would go to meetings, I would go to the canvassing and watch very carefully what daddy was saying and doing and so on. Of course, everywhere we went, his constituency was St. George and everywhere we went, it had to be via St. George. And um, so I learned a lot from him um, in that way, um, service to, to community. And my mother, who was a trained nurse, but in those days, in the early 1940s, um, if you were a colonial civil servant, because we were still a colony in that sense, and you got married, you had to leave the service without pension, without pay, nothing. And that was true of teachers, a lot of teachers, and it was true of nurses, and my mother was a nurse. And um, she didn't get to be able to vote until 1952 for the first time. So all of that was part of my upbringing. Um, then there was studying in England, coming back to Barbados. And I came back to Barbados and started my practice, my um, law practice, at a time when the woman's movement, this is the early 70s now, was starting to make its presence felt. And um, they were really very well organized, invited me to one of their meetings and told me straight away, you have to be our legal advisor. And, um, they did yeoman work and were invited in the mid 70s to produce a document for the parliament to have an idea of how women were feeling. And um, then I ran for the first time in a by-election in the city of Bridgetown um, in 1976 and Prime Minister Tom Adams invited me into his cabinet. It was quite a thing because the, I had determined in the by-election that I would go out the morning after the election and drive around in what we had then were called little mini mocks and thanking people. And that by-election I won and then Six months later, I had to run in the general election. I was the, it was a difficult time in the by-election um, because it's you alone. The other party stole my meeting site for the big opening meeting. And I was so disappointed, but um, I decided I would make the best of it. And they stole my meeting location and we had to find something at the last minute. So when I got up onto the platform, I'd never seen such a large crowd in Barbados in all my life, then, before, since. And I said to the people, you know, they stole our meeting place. So they have the meeting place, but we have the crowd. I never saw so many people at one time. And um, that was encouraging. The women's movement was behind me. And that was extra special to me. And then I, as I said, I had to run a second time and um, I won my seat again and went into the cabinet. It's a strange thing that I got the same portfolio as Sir Grantley Adams had given to my father 
from 1956 to 1961. And his son, Tom Adams, who had become prime minister in 1976, he gave me literally the same portfolio. And um, I built up on some of my father's work. His great thing was to build a new modern hospital. And it's still there, Queen Elizabeth Hospital. And he put a number of what were called in those days, this is the 1950s, early 60s, um, well, right through the 60s, clinics in country districts. He was very strict about that. Everything cannot be in the metropolitan area. We must deal with all of the country districts. And um, all of this, um, I built on that then. I then built polyclinics, of which I was very proud. And um, they had a wider remit. And I had the portfolio of national insurance. And I added to that um, national insurance scheme, as it was called then, the idea, I had difficulty selling it to the people of Barbados, that they should invest in a national insurance scheme, which would allow them, they would put a little money from their salary in there, and in hard times, that they would be able to call upon it, and event eventually when they retired, they would have something, you know, to help them on. And... Uh, it was not well received. People shouted at me in the street, we're not handicaps around here, you know, and so on. I almost lost my seat at the next election, but I did not. And I smiled today because we had this pandemic hitting us last year and people were drawing on their national insurance contributions. I smiled, I said not a word. Nobody remembers the history of it, but you know. Um, but these were the things that inspired me to lead and to go on leading. The fact that I was a woman, which is part of this question, is important. And yes, it was important that I was a woman because I was the first woman to sit in the cabinet of Barbados. I was the third woman to sit in the House of Assembly and, um, Almost immediately, I started looking then to cultivate other women and to mentor them as best I could. And um, that was part of leadership um, in a manner of speaking. And in, in those, at that time, I made a note here um yes um i wanted to say that in every region there are always women who defy the hurdles and the odds the more women who got elected to parliament the more women would get elected Every woman who is elected raises the consciousness and confidence of other women. Sometimes it takes a very long time, as in my own case, where it took 18 years after I entered parliament before I saw two other women, two more women, take their seats. Mia Amo Motley, who is now president, um, Prime Minister uh, Mia Motley, and Henrietta Elizabeth Thompson, who was quite recently our ambassador at the United Nations, both of whom I had mentored. It was one of the most gratifying moments of my life, I have to say. In fact, it was the beginning of a golden 14 year period when in Barbados, women occupied leading positions in government and in the public service. Now I am talking about the 19, the last five years of the, um, the 1990s. Um, into 2008 when we lost the government and went into opposition. But in those 14 marvelous years, the governor of the central bank was a woman. The cabinet secretary was a woman. 
The head of the civil service was a woman. The accountant general was a woman. The head of the foreign service was a woman. The deputy prime minister and leader of government business in the House of Assembly, who was myself, was a woman. And the head of the revenue authority was a woman. All during those years. Wow. Note also, I, I, it, it's, it was a, it, it was, I think it was the very peak of my of my life as a parliamentarian. I served for 32 years, and that, for me, was among the most important. Um, that's my legacy, and that is those are the things that really inspired me to leadership. I'm sorry I've been so long. It's inspirational, and and you have a long history to share, which is why it is it is important for us to hear. I, I would love to hear now from Minister Kabua about what inspired you. Was it similar? Was someone there to to guide you, mentor you in the way that Dame Billy was able to mentor and make space for many of the women that are leading our region right now? Thank you very much, Tony, and a very warm Yahweh to you all from the Marshall Islands. Like Dame Billy, um, my family did inspire me to lead. Um, just observing and, and growing up in a household and a, and a family dynamic where um, the urgency and the need to help the people, to help the community was evident. Um, my family also has a long history of being in politics, being community leaders. So it was something that I naturally came into. And growing up, I was looking at all these role models, my grand uncles, my father, my mother, uh, aunties, uncles, everyone in my family. And they pushed me and inspired me, encouraged me to also be in a position of leadership. So I wouldn't be the person I am today if it wasn't for them. And like Dame Billy, it was important that I was a woman um, in order to achieve what a lot of people thought was the unachievable. My family saw that because I was a woman, because I was educated, and because I had a knack for working with the community, being able to connect with them at that level, being approachable uh, considering my youth, it was easy for me to take their um, needs and, and to voice and amplify their um, needs at the parliament level. So all these things would not have happened if it was not for my family and if it was not for uh, the characteristics that my family urged me to achieve uh, throughout my life. So that's my, my inspirational uh, <coughs> statement for this morning. Thank you. It's so important. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, what you have been able to share and what Dame Billy has been sharing and the connection of family, the importance, and this is something that Dame Meg also spoke to, the importance of family raising girls to see themselves in these positions and the families that we're born into and the families sometimes we choose. Minister Kabua, I'm not sure if you know, but in the Caribbean right now, we have an active volcano that is consistently erupting. Mm -hmm. And um, even us in Barbados, it's erupting in the island of St. Vincent, um, the countries of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but the ash is affecting us across the region. There is the possibility that some people may have to be evacuated from the country because their homes have been so badly affected. What has your country and your region's experience been with managing the impacts of hazards that are related to climate change? Has, have you ever experienced the evacuation of communities? And is that something that had to be managed with, within the Republic of the Marshall Islands? Thank you very much for your question. And first off, I, I just want to say that we here in the Marshall Islands are praying for you all. Uh, we hope you all are safe and that nothing um, happens uh, to, to harm you all. 
And the experiences that um, you all are experiencing is, are, are uh, things that we're seeing much more frequently because of the onset of climate change and the negative uh, impacts of climate change. For low-lying atolls such as the Marshall Islands and Tuvalu and Kiribati, all these other uh, low-lying low atoll states, climate change is our greatest threat. Negative effects are already taking place and will gravely undermine our efforts towards sustainable development and threaten our survival and our sovereignty. When it comes to our heritage, there are a few things we are afraid of. Sea level rise poses coastal lines, land and water length threat, prolonged droughts that threaten our water supply, food, and health security as well, and changes in weather patterns leading to frequency of storm surges, which is what we are experiencing today, and ocean acidification that has an important impact, a uh, grave impact to our rich marine resources. In summary, these impacts threaten the security of our nation and the survivability of the people of the Marshall Islands. I would also like to highlight another area of concern, a grave concern for the people of the Marshall Islands for decades, which is the RMI nuclear legacy. There's ongoing unease about the impacts of lingering radiation in the environment on health of communities and local resources in the RMI. It is important that there is a plan to monitor levels of radiation in our environment, especially our marine environment, which is the people of the Marshall Islands lifeline. Some potential dangers that have been exposed throughout recent disclosures about the low level radioactive, radioactive waste facility on Runet Islands, which is one of the islands uh, that the Runet Dome, Dome is located on in Enewedak Atoll, is that due to sea level rise and increased tidal fluctuations, uh, it's causing a leak at this dome, which is a result of climate change. Lingering radiation on other atolls continues to prevent safe habitation of those islands and needs to be addressed. Noting that long-term impacts could result in the unavoidable outmigration of some of our people, we continue to pursue all means to ensure that our nation survives and that we remain in these islands by implementing measures to build resilience, reduce disaster risks, and support climate change adaptation also promoting renewable energy and energy efficiency in our islands. Within the context of extreme vulnerability to climate change impacts, the RMI developed a national climate change policy framework to provide a blueprint to build resilience in partnership with our regional and global partners. In 2010, RMI held a series of consultations and workshops to gather thoughts for develop developing a policy. The NCCPF is a direct response to the priority of the people of the RMI for climate change adaptation and mitigation, which continues to contribute to the Marshallese people's achievement of their sustainable development and into our recently endorsed 2020 to 2030 National Strategic Plan. However, we cannot do this alone. Regional and global cor cooperation is needed to put RMI and other low-lying atolls on pathway to climate re change resilience and sustainable development. Thank you so, so much for that, Minister Kabua. I, I think there is a lot that we know about each other between the Caribbean and the Pacific, and there's a lot that we do not know about each other. I remember when I first went to the Pacific, I knew about the Bikini Atoll, but I did not know that the Bikini Atoll was in the Marshall Islands because that was not taught to me. And so understanding the legacy of, of the nuclear impact as you just shared with us is something that's critical in the way in which climate change is affecting it. It is important that the Marshall Islands has been the first nation to increase its greenhouse gas reduction pledge um, under the Paris Agreement. The Marshall Islands, there's a saying we have in the Caribbean in Jamaica, something that our former Representative Alison McLean said often, we're little, but we're Talawa. We may be small, but we are powerful. And the Marshall Islands has taken a lot of steps to demonstrate this, ensuring that there are advocates, tireless advocates for climate action and human rights. And we, I st I, we stand in solidarity in the Caribbean. We are, affect we are affected directly as well. We have a lot of low-lying atolls in some of the countries in the North and across the Caribbean. But 
right now, as I was saying, we are being affected by something that is not quite climate. <laughs> We're not sure, you know, it, it may just be the way in which our countries have been created. Dame Billy, Barbados, particularly the northern side of Barbados, was hit by heavy ashfall by La Soufrière, which is the name of the volcano in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in 1979. But not to this extent. Um, this is something a lot of people have been sharing that this is very different what we are experiencing across other countries as a result of La Soufrière. Noting the role that Barbados has played in response generally across the region in the past and even now, what guidance can you offer to leaders to ensure that people and women in particular are central to the response to the volcanic eruption occurring in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and its impact across the region? Well, I have to say that from the Barbados point of view, women are equal and competitive, even as I speak. I know that like we did in 1979, people are preparing all kinds of gifts and so on that's put on boats and taken down to St. Vincent because they are having the worst experience of us all. Um, although I must tell you these last two days, I, it wasn't like this in 1979. Um, I've never seen the ashes of a different um, consistency because I can remember huge bags of it, which people then spread in, their, spread in their gardens. And for the next two, three years, there were bumper crops of everything. Um, and that's a, a, a positive that, that would come out, have come out of it. But even now we can see the role that in all professions and employments are already willing and able to take the lead and the initiative volunteering and when invited to do so, women are the frontline people in our communities. And that process starts early in our lives. I can remember it as a teenager. And um, well, I was a girl guide too, and we were all into that and um, sort of thing. And you just grew up in a community where you would lean forward and say, can I help? What can I do? or I've got this, would you like to have that? Um, that sort of thing. And that is happening as we speak. I will be packing my bundle um, maybe at this weekend, because I have an idea of the kind of things, well, we share ideas about the kind of things that people will be wanting, you know, they, they're going to be wanting good bedding, um, you know, clothes and, um, Women, the women in our uh, NGOs are our um, ladies who do all kinds, and I used to be one of those, I still am, but um, the women here are already and willing to take the lead. And as I said, there are our frontline women in our communities always. Once there's a disaster of any kind, you know, women will be there to put their shoulder to the wheel. So I have no fear about that. We will be told, I think, quite soon, you know, what what is most needed and where you can bring your box and or your bag and, and um, deliver it. So we will, as we always do among these little islands, help each other out. When it's a hurricane, you know, we do the same thing. The um, police help out a lot. Um, the defense force people go down in the uniforms and they help with the, the real heavy lifting. But it's the women who are preparing the food and making sure that babies are safe and that sort of thing. So we've lived through this before and we live through this one, except that this one is tending to be extended. It's not a one day thing. It's going to go on apparently for quite a while. It is. And, and we're entering now into hurricane season in the Caribbean region. And our yes. disaster emergency management agency has told us that there will be at least 
17, I believe, named storms this year. So mm -hmm. the pandemic, the volcano, and the possibility of hurricanes. 2021 is definitely continuing to be something. It's not necessarily a gift, but something that keeps giving. I want well, to ask you both. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. The last hurricane that I saw, the only hurricane I've seen in my lifetime, and my lifetime, I'm 77, and um, Janet in 1956, I think it was too. And um, it was unbelievable how trees came down and it was devastating, but we've not had a hit since then. Um, so I hope that we're not going to get one, not in this year. We've got COVID, now we've got La Soufair. I hope so. so. I hope we're all spared. I yes. hope we are all spared. I'd like to ask both of you, if there were only three areas that small island developing states should focus on to make sure that we build back equal from COVID-19, what do you think they should be? What are the three main areas that we should be focusing on? Sorry. To whom are you addressing? Minister Kabua, would you like to go first? Thank you. I was willing to yield to Dame Billy, but <laughs> sure. Um, the three main areas that small island developing states should look at um, when trying to build back from this pandemic and climate change. For the Marshall Islands, the three main areas that we have discussed and, and um, see as priority areas is uh, water security, ensuring that our populations um, are equipped with adequate and clean water supplies to um, with food security. As you know, the Marshall Islands is peppered across a large span of um, ocean. So a lot of our population, they are far away from the urban areas that have these supplies and resources. So food security, water security is imperative uh, for the livelihood of our people. And the third one, which really um, amplified, was amplified from this uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the uh, closure of our borders is uh, the revitalization of traditional knowledge. Because we were getting less frequent uh, shipments, a uh, bulk of our, our um, goods are imported. So because we were getting less shipments from abroad, we had to look from a look within to our traditional knowledge of fishing, of uh, farming, sustainable ways. Uh, and we understand that these are ways that can also um, prepare us and other small island developing states uh, in terms of climate change, just to be ready uh, and just to be um, on, um, on the verge of, of a bounce back from these shocks that we will experience uh, time and again now that we're seeing an amplification of these um, types of shocks. But those are the three areas that uh, from the marshals we'd like to um, secure, water and food security, as well as uh, revitalizing and um, keeping strong the traditional knowledge. Thank you so much for that. Dame Billy, what are the top three for you? My three, like my predecessor, starts with climate change. Mm -hmm. very worried about warming seas and this is not something new it's something that's been creeping on and too many people do not recognize it when they see it until there's a calamity but warming seas rising sea level damaged reefs which protect our islands and that's what climate change is already, has made clear. I mean, you can see it with the naked eye. Um, and then there is trade. I want to share with you, if I'll be allowed, there is an organization called She Trades. And it's being promoted at this time by the International Trade Center in Geneva. 
and they sent me these wonderful photographs. It's all about women in trade. We know them in all of the marketplaces of the world, in developed and developing and uh, countries. Um, you're going to find a marketplace with lots of women um, trading. And this is so fascinating. She trades. And um, they, um, the um, International Trade Center is, is um, giving them a, a really good um, heads up. And there's this great event that's planned. So trade was my number two. And um, just recently receiving this, you know, it, it's revived all of the, the things that are um, so important to the way in which we trade. And it is true. There are tradeswomen everywhere. I was so pleased to see in the newspaper, um, I think it was last week, a woman who said that um, she, she, she works in the fish market in Christchurch. And so she's cleaning fish, scaling and so on and preparing it and so forth for sale. But, and she's a relative young woman, she owns three boats. So fishermen go out and um, she's really doing exceedingly well as a trade person. And I hope that that will grow and grow like Topsy and so on, and that more and more women will go into that in fishing, in the fishing industry. But, um, well, could happen. Our, our quite recently um, appointed chief agricultural officer is a woman. Young, bright, I've been reading some of what she's uh, doing and so on. But the economy generally is my third concern because we had COVID, we still have it. We're managing it really quite well, but we have COVID which has hurt the economy wherever, I mean, in the great United States, it hurt the economy there, and they're now trying to do repairs, but it's hurt our economy. And um, I am concerned now that we have climate, um, the volcanic um, eruption possibly getting worse over the next several weeks or possibly months, we are told, that will do enormous damage to the economy of small, all of these small islands. And that is a matter of great concern. So climate change, the economy right through these islands and trade, because that is going to have to be our salvation. Those were, those were the, the three things that I, I, I would want to give prominence to. Thank you for that, both Minister Kapu and Dean Billy, because there's so much overlap as well. I guess we are both um, islands in beautiful seas and um, in one case an ocean. And these are all issues, water security, food security, the revitalization of traditional knowledge so that we can feed ourselves, climate change, trade and the economy. Um, we're, we're getting a, a bit to the time where I think it'd be great to also get some questions in from those who are online, but I do want to ask both of you, what, um, what barriers do you think are still existing to women's equal participation in decision-making? While participants, please enter your questions in the Q&A. Um, what barriers do both of you think are still participating? We can start with Minister Kabua again to women equal participation. Thank you, Tony. The first barrier that comes to mind um, when it comes to women taking place or, or taking part in, in high level decision making is the education and awareness bit of it. Um, throughout our islands, there is still uh, that ignorance that uh, women can lead to. Uh, and especially with um, the introduction of, of this Western culture 
and it not meshing properly with traditional culture, um, we're, we're caught in the middle of it. We're a bit confused uh, in these times because traditionally the woman held um, great respect. She, she is the center of Marshallese society. Uh, and Dame Meg had highlighted that a little bit in, in a lot of our Pacific cultures, that there was a, uh, some matrilineal uh, cultures um, but when you mix the Western culture, the modern culture into that, um, it, it, there tends to be some confusion um, that, that we see that limits the women from, from participating, or at least some women. Um, for me, I, I don't think uh, that was much of a, an issue because as I said, uh, my family was the one that really pushed me to, to be in this leadership position. And my family is um, they are, I, I'd like to say they're um, conservative and they're more uh, traditional uh, in that sense. So they understand the strength of a woman, uh, especially a woman in, in a leadership position to really lift um, a society, a culture, uh, a people. So this is one thing that I push and, and urge other young girls to tap into, to this, this sense of pride. Um, the other uh, barrier that I see um, is the socioeconomic barrier. Are us women, we're the primary caretakers in a family. So in the marshals, when you look at these high level positions and Dame Billy also highlighted that, highlighted that as well, a lot of powerful, smart, energetic women are in these high management positions. And when it came to the election time, I was um, speaking to some of my colleagues and asking them, you should run. Why aren't you running? Oh, I have responsibilities at home. I don't have anyone to take care of my family, my kids. They do want to run, but they do not have that support system because nowadays um, it, you survive from the dollar. You don't survive back in the day, uh, how it was back in the day with the um, the extended family living under one household where cousins are taken care of, taken care of by uh, parents and aunties and uncles, what have you. Today, the household structure is more nuclear. So it puts a lot more pressure on the primary caretaker, which in most cases is the woman. And another thing that stems from that is, um, is, is the health part of it. Uh, it the Marshall Islands is one of the places that has a high rate of uh, non-communicable diseases such as diabetes and um, heart diseases. Again, it falls on the woman to take care of those who are ill. So um, it, it's, these are things where the government needs to prioritize these types of supports to the woman um, in, in the educational settings in the household settings um, so that it could free up more time and, and um, encourage more ladies to take up these positions of high political power. Having only two women in a, uh, in a parliament of 33 is not enough to voice this uh, other major population, which is us women. So those are the barriers that I wanted to highlight. Thank you so much for that. Uh, yeah. It the critical mass they say is 30%. So we need to get, get there. Dame Billy, what do you think are the lingering barriers to theme. women's participation? If I can say them with the parliamentary theme, the member, um, being a member of parliament is hard, unrelenting, mostly thankless, but always gratified in work which requires the justification of one's political existence every day. But I have always taken the position that what better cause to offer your passion and your commitment to than that of improving the quality of lives and the building of communities. Women are a high return investment, which yields great dividends. That has been the experience of all of our lives, all of you ladies here and more beyond. Your generation, I'm speaking now to the generation coming after me. They may not be expected to complete the great task that lies before them, but neither 
are they at liberty to abstain from it? And I am seeing young women who are fearless. Oh, I will do it. And you know that that is a promise and just not a remark dropped. And um, there is a Caribbean poet, Andrew Salke, a Jamaican. And I'm always encouraged by certain words which came from this poet. And I, I, it's just a couple of lines. He said, our Caribbean women are our unsung revolutionaries, our vanguard people, the ones who take the strain, carry the visible and invisible burdens, make the telling plans, dream the real large dreams, and forever they act in the face of overwhelming odds. That is what I grew up with and the generation of women coming after me, I am seeing it every, everywhere I'm seeing it and I am very pleased. I am, I am hopeful and happy. And that's why I'm about to go into re-retirement. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for that, Jim Billy. It's true, but we, we don't necessarily want you to go back into re retirement right now. Um, I want to ask both of you, you know, somebody puts in the chat, Dame Billy, your contribution has been immeasurable. You have supported economic security with the NIS, health security, diplomatic and foreign relations. Across all of these, what to you is the legacy that you are most proud of? Oh my, the legacy that I am most proud of, I wrote a note somewhere. Yes, I'm proud of my 32 years service to my country, Barbados. You know, and you know our affair with all of the various portfolios and so on. Um, I don't think that there was, there was anything more important in those 32 years than that you worked relentlessly. I remember when I had a portfolio with, I was deputy prime minister, I was foreign affairs, foreign trade. I had, I was leading government business um, on the floor of the house. And then Prime Minister Arthur, the late Prime Minister Arthur, called me up one morning and said, I'm handing the tourism portfolio to you. I said, Prime Minister, you're killing me. I have no time to sleep. And he said, all right, I'll give you a junior minister to whom then I, um, he handed to, um, tourism. Um, but I have no regrets and I think that my years as a parliamentarian are my legacy. Minister Kabba, your legacy is beginning and continuing. What thus far are you most proud of? And I think we're all excited to see what comes as well. Well, I just want to say that if it weren't for ladies like Dame Meg and Dame Billy and other movers and shakers um, that I grew up looking up to, uh, I wouldn't be here as well. And as you said, my legacy is just starting. Um, but I am proud to be that one girl that managed to get to this level um, and paving the way for other young girls to, and, and women in general, to try. Um, so I want them to look at me and say, okay, if she can do it, then I think I can do it too. That's I think uh, the, the most profound thing of um, my legacy so far. Thank you for that. We have a question saying, how do you engage in your leadership with love, not competition? Would you like to take that question, Minister Kabua? How do we engage with love and not competition? Yes. Oh, well, to navigate this world today, a predominantly male world, we have to be strategic. Uh, and how can you be more strategic than to be loving? So uh, I like to say that that is my strategy being in, uh, in, in parliament is to figure out a way to work at their level, work with these people that I work with. 
um, and and to um, not be competitive about it, not to be confrontational about it, because maybe that works man to man. It, it's it's uh, engraved in our DNA. So what's another strategy if you're working woman to man or in other cases um, like that? And for me, the best approach is to um, approach it from that loving stand, uh, the standpoint. Thank you so much for that. That is another thing that women bring to the table. Um, for Dame Billy, there's a question that says Barbados is one of a few countries in CARICOM with unemployment insurance, <laughs> which has proven to be a lifeline in the COVID-19 pandemic, including for women and their families. Other than governments, what role, if any, do you think the women's movement can play in advocating for increased investments in social security and social protection? They must get on the road, talk to their parliamentarians. You know, um, a lot of women started up working with NGOs and they have remarkable skills, management skills. These are the women who are really at the, what do you call it? The front lines. Mm -hmm. And they're more highly skilled in bringing reluctant and other people along than people give them credit for. So I think that is the, the, the sort of thing that continues. There's a lot of that in Barbados. I mean, it was very helpful to me. And um, I think that most women are prepared now. Family planning has a lot to do with this. That was that's another part of my life. Um, because I can remember when I was a child and my mother took me into town and met up with her friends. You know, the first question was, well, how many children do you have now? And there were always two numbers. So many living, so many dead. And within a relatively short number of years, we turned that around. We turned that around. I can remember when children were given um, to drink, if, if, they, if their parents couldn't afford milk, which you had to pay for unless you, you had a cow, um, you know, if you were in the country and, and you had livestock and so on. But um, those were hard days and um, women fought with them. Um, the diseases of those days which attacked children. Um, I can remember it all and it was in a way like a bad dream. Um, those were the time of what in Barbados we call the Great Tribulation. And we got past that. Mm -hmm. And now we have to live with new challenges. And I think that you will find that women and particularly young women, I, I open the newspaper every day and this is worrisome for me, and it goes back many years, um, how a lot of young men in Barbados, and I think it's right through the Caribbean too, are getting lost in bad things, things that are not good for them, are not going to take them anywhere in this life. Where on the other hand, young women are looking to better themselves. We are fortunate that in Barbados, education is virtually free at point of delivery, health care free at point of delivery. And I mean the best health where there's no poor broken down thing for people who can't afford to pay. Everybody can be treated. Um, and th th this, the, 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 Barbados is a small island, 14 by 21 miles. And it is like a, a community in a way. If you drive up for half an hour and you get to St. Lucie, you know, you, it feels as though you left here and you went to Trinidad. But um, that's who we are. 
and women have played a role in all of this. I remember one of the things that really upset me when I began to understand about politics. Now we all grow sugar cane, some of us no longer, it's not a viable crop for some other countries and they've gone to something else. But when I was growing up and a teenager and so on, um, sugar was big for us. And then as I grew older, somebody once said to me, but you know, in Barbados, women had the cane, the cane would be put into huge parcels and tied around and put on the head with a little cloth pad. And then I discovered that it is only in Barbados that women headed cane. And it upset me a great deal. It still does. Even as I speak to you, I can feel it rising inside of me. That should never have been like that. But that was how it was. But in the other islands, it was the men who headed cane, not the women. The women cut the cane, made the bundles, and the men then carried these heavy poundage um, to the dray carts like that, shaped like that, led by mules back to the to the factory site. And all of those I wanted, things I, I noticed when I was young and I was already a thinking person. And that, I found that upsetting. I think that is something that both you and Minister Kabua have noted that your vision of what was fair and unfair also was something that motivated you. Now I know I have, we have kept both of you long because both of what you have to say is so interesting. And unfortunately, Dame Meg has had to leave us because she had another meeting to go to. But if you don't mind, there are two more questions that we would like to ask that have come through. And I think it's very interesting, Minister Kabua, that you were speaking about the traditional and the modern in a way that we don't usually hear it. Because generally, when we speak about the traditional, the traditional is not a space in which you see gender equality. Or This is the narrative. It is not the reality, but that is the narrative. And the reality for many countries, especially countries in the Pacific like yours, is that that's not the case. So a question here is that as traditional leaders and healers, what do you see the, or how do you see the national health system within countries acknowledging and recognizing traditional healers as caregivers? And will, do you think they will ever consider working with that kind of traditional knowledge in the health sector? What a wonderful question. Uh, here in the Marshall Islands, uh, my colleague, the Minister of, of Health, he has set up a task force to look at integrating traditional medicine, traditional um, knowledge in health uh, into the modern health system that we have, because we, have to recognize that both of them are equally as valuable, especially for a people that still depend heavily on uh, traditional medicine for uh, ailments that we have lived with for um, since, since inception uh, versus the ailments that we're seeing today that are brought in and by, by modern life, such as NCDs and, and cancer and what have you. So um, it, it's just acknowledging that uh, both of these uh, health um, systems and, and means of, of treating people are equally as valuable to our people. We have so much to learn from each other. I hope that we there's more exchange that can happen because this is extremely exciting and could be very useful for many other spaces so that we can balance that traditional and the more modern Western forms that some of which are quite useful as well. Um, this is the last question that comes from the, the, the participants that I'll ask. And I will round up with one last question that I sent to you earlier, because I think it's something that'll inspire those on the call. But this question is about climate activism and that we've been advocating for 1.5 and I'm guessing that's sea level rise, but it has already shown that even just a one percent, not percent, it's one um, degree, or it's not degree, but anyway, one, one rise is already too much for islands to buffer and plan for. As women on the inside and knowing about bureaucracy, how do you think climate initiatives can be streamlined given that we really only have 10 years 
to get real about implementing the Paris Agreement if we are to stand a chance? That's the question from one of the participants. Would you like to start first, Minister Kabu, and then I'll go to Dame Billy. Thank you very much. How can we better streamline uh, these activities to achieve 1.5 degree? Uh, well, as you said, here in the Marshall Islands, we have, for such a small country, we have um, put a major footprint um, at the global level in terms of climate change activism and um, championing. And for our case, our strategy moving forward, we have to look at it uh, from the various levels. So internally, it's increasing the education and awareness of it. Uh, revisiting our curriculum so that we can in include uh, climate change in into our curriculum, which we are doing at, at the moment, um, to spread more awareness because our elders, they, they are confused. They don't know what's happening. They, they hear this concept, oh, climate change, the, the um, you know, things are much more unpredictable, but they do not understand why. So it's bulking up on that uh, education and awareness. Then at the regional level, we need to band with the other Pacific Islander states and, and states such as um, the safe sweet countries we have in the Caribbean in order to amplify from the small island development um, position. And then at the global level and forums such as I, uh, IMO and the ILO, we need to have a strong voice uh, and the Marshall Islands as a lone country cannot do all of these uh, by itself. So we need to stand with the other uh, countries in the Pacific as well as um, uh, around the world that are experiencing the same struggles and same um, threats that we are experiencing here in the islands. So looking at these uh, various levels and shaping our activities to um, better achieve these goals is how we can address the 1.5 uh, campaign. Thank, Thank you so you. much. It is degree. I have I, <laughs> my brain tripped on me. Yes, Dame Billy, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I am mostly guided nowadays by my nephew. I helped raise a nephew who is a marine biologist, and this is his passion. And he started to talk about this a long time before it became, you know, common discussion in, um, in Barbados. And um, I, am, I am really worried because uh, there's another aspect of it. We have been exporting fish to the United States for many years. And um, so there is a market out there that we are liable to see fall into decline or come to an end, heaven for friend. So we have to become more serious about the warming of the seas and um, the damage to the reefs. That's where a lot of young fish are brought into being. And um, the protecting of our islands, generally speaking. So Frere is not the only volcano. We have a, a, a series of them here in the Caribbean. Um, Montserrat had a terrible, um, forget how long ago, it seems so long ago, but I remember flying over it in um, a small Liat plane. And I was just horrified when I looked down and, and, and saw that, I mean, there was nothing. Most of the people from Montserrat have gone to other islands. Some of them have gone to England because it's still a colony in that, <clears throat> in that sense. And um, there's one, and there, there's many of them are called Soufrere. That's, that's, that's the problem. Um, so you need to know which island you're talking about, but, um, Climate change is not going to, to um, make life any easier for us. And the protection process, we need to come together. We have something called the CSME, the Caribbean 
help me. Single market economy. Single market and, and, and single economy. I sat in the room in Guyana while we were putting this together. And I remember saying, please, don't just say and. Say and single, you have to say it twice. Because people are going to start off with the single market and that is doing quite well, well it was up to the time that I retired, which was 08. And then say single economy, that's where the sticking point is going to come. Nobody even talks about the single economy. But at some point, we may well have to begin to recognize the CSME in its entirety, which is how it was planned to be. But sometimes people are afraid of words which can be very powerful. But the she trades may be a way in which we get there. I am, I am giddy with excitement over it. Um, I am going to read all of this and really um, look to see ways and means that we might not encourage some of our women in the Caribbean to become you know, more like what I'm seeing here, lovely photographs, lots of fine print, but. Um, <laughs> and much to learn from the Pacific about this. Yes, yes. Standards in the Pacific um, that are shared. Um, there's a lot to learn from the Pacific. Yes. This, this is a question for both of you, because I know we are almost at 8 p.m. in the Caribbean and 12, it's noon. <laughs> Um, in, in the Marshall Islands, so it's time for you to have lunch. Um, it's always so interesting how our spaces have come to be how they are right now. When I think that the Marshall Islands have been inhabited for over 3,000 years with the people who are still there, and the Caribbean has been created through the toil and migration of people forced, um, unfortunately, many genocides, so the indigenous People are not in many of the countries anymore, but we have created a space that we want to be and stay in. What are the messages that both of you would want to share with young women and older women? Because we need all women in parliament, in leadership, leading in their houses and leading in their houses of representatives who are interested in leadership, but are not quite ready to take the leap because they're unsure, they may not have the health, the childcare and healthcare that you were speaking of, uh, Minister Kabua, but the good thing is we have examples that Dame Billy put into place here of subsidized childcare. We can share some of that, um, the experiences in Barbados, but what messages would you want to let these women know to get them into the free? Thank you for the question. Uh, I just want to remind um, us women in general that w those in power, those who are not in power, those who are um, are holding down the fort, uh, so to speak, I want to remind us that we're all we have. Uh, we need to band together. We need to strengthen each other, empower each other, because as I mentioned in, in the previous um, interview, we're a force to be reckoned with if we do come together as one. And to those uh, who are interested in, in a um, role in leadership, I would advise them to build strategic uh, networks with women, with men, um, and to also hit on what um, Dame Meg had mentioned earlier, which, which really resonates with me, to educate their young to, as she said, empower the girls and educate the boys. Um, but to educate both our, our um, girls and boys, that is very important because as mothers, the, the, the first educator for a child, the first teacher is typically the mother. So um, through education and through building these um, strategic networks, that's where a woman can really um, succeed uh, at the leadership level. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister Kabua. Dame Billy, over pick to you. up Minister Kabua's thread. 
for many years. But I was um, still, but I was in Parliament for the better part of my best years. But um, there was a rising concern about boys. And um, we have to be very mindful. I pick up the newspaper every morning and all I'm seeing, sometimes on the front page, sometimes on the back page, and then sometimes several pages inside, young boys coming before the court. They're into drugs, they're into stealing, you know, and grandmothers are crying tears. Um, we have to find a way to not in the, you know, powerful mother way of, you know, look, I am going to tell you what you must do and so on. But we, we these, these young men have to be rescued. And some are even not quite that young, but they really need to be rescued. They don't want to work, not, genu not, not genuinely. They will tell you, yeah, but I'm looking for a job, but it's not. But in all of the, the court pages, I infrequently will see sometimes women, but always men, young men. And I am seeing a creeping thing now with older men who should know better. And that is something that women are going to have perhaps to take the high road with and try to, um, to, to, to bring good thinking to, to these young people who um, and it starts in the school system as well. And they give up so easily. You know, there's an old saying that if you want to do better than the other fellow, you've got to be prepared to work harder and longer than that fellow if you are going to succeed. But I don't get the impression that they're so anxious about working harder. And we have to turn this around um, it's worrisome. I, I mean, more and more people every weekend, it's more of them. And I, I'm, I'm thinking that we're losing them to all of these drugs and other things that, you know, everybody's got a gun and, and so on. And we, we have to turn that around. It's done a lot of damage in other islands in the Caribbean and well, everywhere in the world, I have to say, I don't even talk about the United States um, and places like that. Um, but this is something that women now have to fight back on. We have to take, we have to take that and, and try to do the best that we can to reverse some of the really quite horrible things that I see reported in the, the press and elsewhere. Thank you both so much, Kumul Tata. Thank you. We are so honored to be able to have learned from you, to listen to your experiences, and to see so many similarities. Caribbean islands and Pacific islands, we may be far in terms of the time it takes to get to one another, but we are definitely very close when it comes to our experiences of this world. We are looking forward to a time where we're all inoculated. We are speaking no more of COVID-19, in the present, but something that we have conquered. And we will be able to address and share the stories of how we also overcame the challenges associated with climate change and reversed the temperature rises that are threatening our regions and our countries. Thank you so much. We will remain in touch. There are many more of these to come because we see how much we have to learn from each other. Have a wonderful lunch in the Pacific and have a wonderful, oh, yes, Minister. Sorry, uh, before we close off the um, dialogue, uh, I, I'd like to say something, uh, words of- Please. Um, thanks. All right, thank you. But I'll, I'll uh, happily yield to uh, Dame Billy if, if she wanted to close the, um, have well, a closing I, I, I would just want to say that what has just happened here over the last hour and a half um, was not in my imagination. Um, 
this has been an experience and I wouldn't have missed it. I, 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 I wouldn't have missed it. I would beat up on myself if for some reason I had to say no. But because um, I'm very serious about re-retiring. But um, it was a wonderful experience. And as you say, the island nations like ours, there's not a wide gap between us. And so we understood each other so perfectly well. And I want to thank UN Women for the opportunity that has been given. I thought that many other people would have been, you know, invited to, to, to um, call up and speak and so on. But um, it was wonderful. It was a wonderful afternoon. I enjoyed every minute of it. And I thank you for having invited me and for meeting new people. Thank you so much, Dame Billy. Minister Kabua. Thank you. And, and I just want to say that being in the same room as um, uh, with these women, Dame Meg and Dame Billy, I am honored. Uh, and I just want to thank um, Dame Billy for her, her um, stories, her uh, information, a lot of things that I learned. And, and you're right. Um, the Caribbeans and the islands of the Pacific, they may be similar in so many aspects, but they're quite different. And I'm, I'm having my team uh, look up some of the points that um, Dame Billy had brought up during her conversation. Really interesting. And again, we have a lot to learn. I want to thank uh, Dame Meg for her profound statement uh, to open up our dialogue. And of course, to thank all the ladies that have uh, come online to listen to this uh, feminist dialogue. Uh, what an honor. And last but not least, uh, thanks to UN Women for inviting me to, to be part of this SIDS uh, feminist dialogue. It is um, a platform where I learned a lot and um, really enjoyed taking part in. And I support uh, having this type of coalition, this SIDS Women and Leaders uh, Coalition. And I look forward to uh, uh, future dialogues um, and, and listening to other women in leadership uh, roles to uh, participate. And to end my statement, um, I re was really happy when uh, Dame Billy had mentioned that women are high return investments that yield high dividend. Um, and I want to part with uh, Marshally saying, we call it kagariri, um, which are, are um, sayings that have been passed down generations after generations to really remind us of who we are as a people, who we are as women. Um, but it, it, it translates to roughly what um, Dame Billy had said. And that state, that term is So translates to women are high return investments that yield high dividends. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, it was a pleasure being part of this dialogue and I hope you all uh, keep safe. Thank you so much. And you may get an invitation soon when things are all clear to come and join us in Barbados. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful night. everyone. Thank you. Thank you again, Dame Billy, for everything. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.